Hi, good morning, everybody. Good morning. So today we are going to start unit eight, which is going to be chi squared tests. Um, they're super cool. I think they're really, really neat. Um, but first, I want to see if anybody had any questions about anything before we get started, like unit seven homework or anything like that. Nope, looking good. All right. So the first thing we're going to do before we start unit eight is we're just going to kind of um, summarize what we learned in unit six and seven. So hopefully you guys can see that okay. So in unit six, we were looking at comparing percentages. So in unit six, we were looking at comparing P to P hat. And we had our standard error formula. which was P times one minus P divided by N. Okay, and we also had our Z test statistic, which was P hat minus P naught divided by N. <clears throat> now in unit six, we also had our central limit theorem. So remember the central limit theorem is telling you hey, is your sampling method good enough? Are you going to have enough data in your sample to actually say that it looks like your population? And for the central limit theorem, for unit six, we had to have a random sample. We had to have a large sample. And by large, we mean at least 10 successes and 10 failures, which we calculated by taking n times p and making sure that it was greater than or equal to 10, and taking n times 1 minus p and making sure that was greater than or equal to 10. And the last thing is that we wanted a large population. So this means that we would be more likely to have some independence and we're more likely to have um, replicative replication, be able to <laughs> replicate our sample. We need that to be at least 10 times bigger than our sample. All right, so that was unit six while we were looking at percentages. In unit seven, we were looking at means. So again, we were comparing means and we were saying, hey, how likely is it that our sample looks like our population? And in this case, our standard error was a little bit easier to calculate. It was sigma divided by the square root of n. And instead of using the Z test, we had to use the T test. Oh, sorry, that should have been standard error. My apologies. And we also had to worry about degrees of freedom. The central limit theorem for that one was almost the same as it was for unit six. The only difference is how do you determine a large sample? If you're just taking averages of things, you can't have 10 successes and 10 failures. That doesn't make sense. So when it came to determining if a sample was large in unit seven, we just had to have the sample be greater than or equal to 30.
Now in unit eight, what we're going to be doing is that we're going to be comparing categorical data. So before we were dealing with actual numbers like comparing percentages, comparing means, and now we'll be dealing with categorical data. So when we're dealing with categorical data, and we'll get to this, but it's just nice to have a little summary page of when to use what test. We're dealing with categorical data. We're going to be looking at the difference of our observed values minus our expected values. We're going to be getting a value from that, which is called chi-square. Sometimes you'll see it like this. And we'll also be comparing our degrees of freedom. Just like before when we were doing other statistics, like this one and this one and this one, what we're going to see is that after we're done running a test, we're going to have a p-value. So just like we did hypothesis test in unit six, got a p-value and compared it to alpha. We're going to get a p-value in unit seven, compare it to alpha. We're going to do the same thing here. So at the end, we're still going to get a p-value and compare it to our alpha and decide, is it low, reject or null hypothesis? If it's not, you fail to reject. And the central limit theorem for this one is similar to the other one. So the first thing you want is randomness. Okay, so remember, random reduces bias. Now, the second thing when it comes to having a large sample when you're doing a chi-square is that you want the expected count in each cell to be at least five. All right. So I'll give you guys a second to write all of that down in case you came in a little bit late. All right. Oh, yeah? yeah, I'm sorry. I was just looking at the unit eight, the intro, and my computer kind of glitched. I just want to make sure that first one is a zero minus C. It's an O. Oh, okay. Okay. Just making sure. Thank you. Yeah, you're good. <clears throat> By the way, thank you for saying that, Talia. That reminds me. We're going to have gale force winds today. Um, and my power already like went out for a couple minutes and came back on. So if I disappear, give me one minute to come back. If I don't come back, then my internet's out. Class is canceled. Just a heads up. Could happen. All right, go ahead and give me a little emoji if you guys are done writing. Thank you, everybody. So just to get us going on what the heck is observed and what is expected, OK? Let's say we roll a dice. Six hundred times. Okay, so on the dice we're gonna have a one, two, three, four, five, and six.
now what you would expect is you would expect all of your dice rolls to be evenly distributed. So you would expect to get 100 ones, 100 twos, and so on. <clears throat> now, let's say that we actually carry this out and we take a dice and we roll it 600 times. Now, the probability of getting 100 on every single dice is pretty slim, right? But they should be close. So let's take a look. Let's say that we get 98 ones. Let's say we get 102 twos. <clears throat> let's say that we get 85 threes. 94. Let's say we get 125. And then 105 sixes. So, if we just look at this, <clears throat> it's kind of hard to tell if the dice is really favored towards one number over the other. So yeah, we got 120 fives that we rolled when we did this 600 times, but is it that different? Is it different enough to say that the dice is weighted towards five? So what would be nice is if we had a mathematical way of comparing the observed the expected count. So here's how we do that is that we're going to calculate our chi squared. So what chi squared is, is that we're going to sum up the differences between the observed count and the expected count, and we're going to square it, and then we're going to divide by our expected count. So in this case, we would have 98 minus 100 squared divided by 98 plus 102 minus 100 squared. Oh, I'm sorry. We divided by 100. Divided by 100. plus 85 minus 100 squared. Okay, so that we would do that for all of these. So the next one would be 90 minus 100 squared. All right, so then after you do all of those calculations, what you're going to get is you're going to get your chi-squared number. It's kind of like the test statistics, where that number is going to tell you <clears throat> what's the likelihood that you're expected or close to your observed or really far away. So let me do the math real quick. Okay, so after we add all these together, we're going to get a chi squared of 7.58. And the rule of thumb is the larger the chi square, that is the bigger the differences between what you observed and what you expected. The more likely. To reject whatever your null hypothesis is. Okay, so you'll have a low key value. So 
So the higher your chi-square, the lower you expect your p-value. <coughs> All right, now usually when we do chi-squares, we're not just looking at one variable. So here we're only looking at dice rolls. Usually when we're looking at chi-square, we're comparing two variables. And we want to know if they're independent. Let's do an example. A birthday party. Of 100 kids. Has Seventy boys and thirty girls. Suppose that forty percent a and sixty percent. As well. Create a contingency table. Your expected count. chi squared, the null and all alternative hypothesis are actually really easy. So your null hypothesis, the thing that you always give the benefit of the doubt, is that you always assume that your two variables are independent. That means that one isn't going to affect the other one. So gender, and dessert preference, Are independent. And then your alternative hypothesis is just going to be the opposite, which is that they are not. So, if gender and dessert preference are independent, then we should see the same amount of girls eating cake as we see boys eating cake. And same thing, we should see the same amount of girls eating pie that we see boys eating pie. It'd be kind of like if you thought that um, boys and girls had color preferences, like maybe girls would prefer yellow birthday hats and boys would prefer green birthday hats. Then what you would do is that you would gather the numbers. If you have an overwhelming amount of girls in yellow hats and you have an overwhelming boys in green hats, then maybe they're not independent. Maybe gender does have some sort of relationship to color preference. <clears throat> so with that said, let's make our contingency table. And let me show you what a contingency table looks like.
So what a contingency table is going to look like <clears throat> is it's going to look like the frequency tables that we looked at way back in chapter one and chapter two. Where you're going to have boys, which we had 70 boys, and we had girls, which we had 30 girls. Which means that we had 100 people total. My next question is, if 40% of all the people at the party ate cake, okay, then I would expect 40% of boys to eat cake, and I would expect the same, which is 40% of the girls ate cake. So I need to find what 40% of 70 is. find 40% of 70, I would say 70 times 0 0.4. And that means that I would expect 28 boys to eat cake. Now remember, I also expect 40% of the 30 girls at the party to eat cake. So <clears throat> I would take 30 times 0 0.4. And I would get 12, which means I would have 40 people all together eating cake, which makes sense because that lines up with the 40 out of 100, which is 40%. Now, if I wanted to figure out how many boys ate pie, well, I know that 60% of my party goers ate pie, so I would take 70 times 0.6, and I would get my number here. Okay, so that's going to give me 42. You could have also rationalized, hey, we have 70 people total. We have 28 here, which means that we have to have 48 here to get the right amount of people. And we're going to do the same thing for the girls. So we would expect 60% of our girls to eat pie, which would be 18. which again gives us a total count of 60. All right, before we move on, I just wanna pause here and see if anybody has any questions on that math or um, any thoughts about that. Looking good? All right. So that's what we would expect. Now let's say we tally up the dessert and gender. And fine. So we're going to make another contingency table. And let's say that the boys that ate cake, let's say that Winley saw 10 eat cake and 60 eat pie. And for girls, let's say that we saw 10 eat cake and 20 eat pie.
Now I'm going to write the expected counts next to these in this opposite corner in red, just so that we can remember them. <clears throat> okay, so we have 28, 42, 12, and 18 for our expected count. Now what we want to do is that we want to see, hey, are these that different or are they the same? So we're going to calculate that chi-squared, which is your observed, minus your expected, divided by your expected. We're going to have 10 minus 28 squared divided by 28, plus 10 minus 12 squared divided by 12, plus 60 minus 42 squared divided by 42, plus 20 minus 18 squared. divided by Alright, so that's going to give us a chi-squared of 19.84. Now, what I said before is that not only do you need the chi-square, but you also need the degrees of freedom. So here's what the degrees of freedom are going to be. Is it's going to be the number of categories that you have in each row minus the number of categories you have in each column. So here I would have my number of categories in my row minus one times the number of categories I have in my column minus one. So for my row, I have cake and I have pie, which means I have two categories. So that would be two minus one. And for my column, I have boys and girls. So I have two categories, so it'd be two minus one. of freedom would be one. Now, just like in the last couple of chapters, you can find your p-value by looking at your chi-squared and using degrees of freedom, but we're going to use technology because we have it, so why not? <clears throat> and also the chi-square tables can be just as inaccurate and um, tedious as the T tables, so we're just going to be using technology to find these. So let me show you how to use that technology to find those numbers, and then we will talk about how to interpret them. So we are in unit 8, so if you click on unit 8, and you scroll down, there's a bunch of different um, chi-square calculators. I just like to click on the first one. So I really like this calculator and I'll tell you why. The reason I really like it is because you can either just enter your data into here or you can actually type your chi-square and your degrees of freedom and it will put out the p-value. So if I input our chi-square into here, 19.84 and my degrees of freedom, it will give me my p-value, which is 0. 
If you give you a p-value that small when you're doing the homework, just say it's zero. Now, if you actually wanted to put the values in here, you only have to put in your observed values. Okay, and then it will spit out all of the stuff. Kind of makes me think that maybe I did my chi square wrong. That's okay. It's fairly early. Mama had a hard weekend. All right. Also, if you have a chi square that has more rows or column data, you can always extend these. All right. We have one last thing to talk about when it comes to chi square. And it is this. How do we find expected values if we only have observed values? How do we find expected values if we only have observed values? All right, so let's look at an example. Let's say again that we have boys and girls at a party. And let's say we want to see if they pick yellow or green party hat. Okay, and let's say for boys, we have seven pick yellow. And we have 13 girls pick yellow. That's 20 total. Okay. And then for green, let's say that we have fifty-three pick green. Okay, so that means we're gonna have sixty boys total. And then for girls, let's say that we have 27. And then we have 16. So from this table, we know some things right off the bat. We know that there are 60 boys and 40 girls. We also know that 20 people chose yellow and 80 people chose green. Now, here's why that's important. If 20 out of 100 people chose yellow, that means that 20% of people should have chosen yellow, regardless of gender. And if 80 out of 100 people chose green, that means that I would expect 80% of my people to choose green. Again, regardless of gender. So what that means is that out of, say, 60 boys, I would expect 20% to 
pick yellow. And same thing with girls. So out of 40 girls, I would expect 20% of them to also choose yellow. So if I have 60 boys and I expect 20% of them to choose yellow, what I need to do to find my expected count is I need to take 20% of 60. So to do that, that would be 60 times 0 0.2, which would give me 12. Same thing for the girls. So of the 40 girls, I would expect 20% to choose yellow. That would be 40 times 0 0.2, which would give me 8. And I would do the same thing for green. So I expect 80% of the 60 boys to choose green. So if I did that math, I would get 40 each. And the same thing for girls that chose green. So I would expect 80% of my 40 girls to choose green. So I would expect that to be 32 of my girls. opposite way. What if I had done the percentage of boys, so say I had 60 boys or 60% boys and 40% girls, then if I had 20 people that chose yellow, I could have multiplied 20 by 60% and I also could have multiplied 80 by 60% and gotten the same number. So here's kind of a quick way to find the expected count. Notice that when we did it here, we looked at the totals for the rows and also the totals for the columns to figure out what percentage of our population each of those categories made up. So here, 60 boys out of 100 would be 60%. 40 girls out of 100 would be 40%. And similarly, 20 people that like yellow out of 100 would be 20%, and so on. So to figure out what our expected count was, we took that column total and we multiplied it by the percentage for our row total, which would be the row total divided by the overall total. And remember I said that word either way, whether we made these percentages and left these as counts or vice versa. So what that means is if you want to find an expected count for a cell, you're going to take the row total times the column total And divide it by the overall total. Which is a nice num or a nice formula to know because rarely, if ever, we have really nice round numbers in the tens or the hundreds. So sometimes we get really funky numbers, and just having a formula like this is super helpful. So let's take a look at a quick example, and then we'll call it a day, and then um. Tomorrow we'll look at actually running an entire hypothesis test, how to set up the null hypothesis, all that good stuff. <clears throat> so for example, find the expected count for 
eat so So let's say that we're looking at Democrats and Republicans, and we wanted to see if there was a relationship between whether or not they voted. Maybe it was a local election. Okay, so let's say that here we have nine and seven, and here we have 15 and 13. So I see 9 plus 7 is going to give me 16 total. 15 and 13 is going to give me 28. All right, so just to get us started. If I wanted to find the expected count for this cell, that would be the expected amount of people that voted that were Republican. I would take the row total, which is 24, times the column total, which is 16, and I would divide it by the overall total, which is 44. I would have 24 times 16 divided by 44. And I would get an expected count of 8.72. So what was that for? That was total people that voted that were Republican? Yep, so that's the amount of people we would expect to vote that are Republican. Okay. All right, so I want you guys to just take a whack at figuring out the expected count for the remaining three of these. Okay, so I'll give you guys just a minute. Again, if you guys could throw up uh, emoji, let me know you're done. That would be cool. Thanks, Maddie. Thanks, Evan. Maddie, when are you going to get your arm out of the sling? Um, seven to eight weeks since my surgery. So about six or five weeks, I think. Oh, so kind of a long time. Here, I'll show you. It's like, it's really weird. So it's like, so it's like this. Oh, weird. 
And so I can like write. I have a, I'm at a stool in my desk, which is kind of weird, but it's like really weird because I'm like leaning into my writing and like moving my whole body when I'm writing. Trying to write but with like your really arm against your body. Oh, you poor thing. Well, I wish yeah. you just a quick- It's definitely episode. strange. Thank you. All right, so let's take a look at this and figure out the expected counts for each cell. So if I wanted to figure out the expected count for this cell, I would take the column total, which is 20, times the row total, which is 16, and divide it by the overall total. So I get about 7.27. For this one, for Democrats that voted, I would take the column total, which is 24, times that row total, which is 28, divided by 44, and I get about 15.27. And last but not least, for 13, I would take the column total, which is 20, times the row total, which is 28, divided by the overall total, which is 12.72. All right, so those give me my expected count. And remember, the reason that these give me my expected count is let's say I wanted to know what the total number of Republicans in my sample was, then I would do 16 divided by 44. That would give me the percentage of Republicans in my sample. Then if I know that 24 people total voted, well, if I wanted that to be the same percentage of Republicans that voted that were in my sample, I would do 24 times that percentage. And you can do it the other way too. So if you wanted to look at the percentage of people that voted, which would be 24 out of 44, and then figure out out of our 16 Republicans, what percentage of them should have voted if voting and um, political party were independent. That is how you would find those counts. All right, any thoughts on finding the expected value? Does that feel okay? All right, so this is a introductory or was an introductory just into how we read a contingency table how are the expected counts found and how do we find the difference between the observed and the expected values so instead of just subtracting them we want to know how far away are they and also proportionally how far away are they like being off by five people is a pretty big deal when you're only looking at 10 people, but being off by five people isn't that big of a deal if you have 100 people, right? So what we're gonna do next time is we're gonna put all these ideas together and actually form a full chi-squared hypothesis test, which I think is gonna be so much fun. So um, that is it for class. I will see you guys later. Don't forget to shoot me an email if you have any questions, okay? All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, can I ask something real quick? Yeah. Sorry, I'm kind of. Uh, so, um, hold on, sorry. Uh,